Allianz is a world-known brand. It is a major global insurance and asset management company. And Allianz Technology is an operating entity within Allianz Group, which provides this innovative technology solutions uh, to all of the entities within the group to meet and exceed those needs. Don't be afraid to surround yourself with the experts and people who know, because you cannot know everything. Maybe I'm a good manager, but I'm not a good expert in particular technology. Don't be afraid to speak to your clients. Don't be isolated, because sometimes we are afraid to bring bad news to the clients. Really, customer focus is essential, because technical excellence without customer focus, it's you know, it's, it's just a dream, right? This is Siana TV. My name is Hendrik Deckers. I'm here today with Natasha Davidova, who is the head of infrastructure and information security at Allianz Technology. A very warm welcome, Natasha. Thank you, Hendrik. How are you? Natasha, you have a degree in economics and banking and finance from the uh, London School of Economics. You started your career as a consultant at Accenture and then you moved into technology leadership roles at uh, Standard Chartered Bank, at Deutsche Bank and at um, Salesforce. And you joined Allianz Technology in 2021. So Natasha, tell us a little bit more about yourself, what's your background um, and how did you arrive in this position? I was born in Moscow, and you're right, I did have an international economics degree, and I never thought at the time that I will end up in technology. But at the time, um, Russia was opening up, and Accenture was one of the companies which wanted to build business there. So they hired a cohort of seven people mm -hmm. and sent us to London to get some experience. And Accenture was really the company which shaped me professionally and possibly personally to an extent, mm -hmm. uh, of very high standard of delivery, of best practices. And I really enjoyed working in a highly diversified international environment, seeing the world. I was in my 20s and I thought that should continue. So here I am. <laughs> Super. And uh, Allianz, of course, is a, is, is a well-known brand, a big name, a big brand. But tell us a bit more about the company and what is the role of Allianz Technology? Allianz is a world-known brand. Uh, it is a major global insurance and asset management company with the purpose of securing the future of the clients mm -hmm. and protecting and growing the most valuable assets. So Allianz uh, provides all sorts of insurance products, for example, uh, pet insurance, uh, property and casualty, life insurance. We even, uh, we even insure uh, films like James Bond films <laughs> and Burj Khalifa buildings in Dubai. So it's mm -hmm. extremely diversified, d diversified bu business mm -hmm. with a lot of very diversified needs. Mm -hmm. And Allianz Technology is an operating entity within Allianz Group, which provides this innovative technology solutions uh, to all of the entities within the group to mm -hmm. meet and exceed those needs. And our aspiration is to become the technology partner of choice for operating entities within the group. Okay, and can you give me some numbers? How big is the group? How big is Allianz Technology? Absolutely. Um, Allianz Group is uh, 155,000 people strong. It's a big company. Um, Allianz Technology uh, is um, around um, 9,000 people and growing. Mm -hmm. We are going through a large program at the moment called GearShift, mm -hmm. where we're consolidating IT from various operating entities to the central team. So we um, expect to grow to uh, maybe up to 15,000 people wow. okay. uh, in the next couple of years. So it's, it's a relatively large <laughs> setting. And uh, we, are, uh, we are coming from very diverse backgrounds. We operate in many countries, uh, in all of the regions. We are very strong in Europe, but equally also in the US, in Asia Pacific, in uh, Africa as well. Mm -hmm. So we're a truly global company with a truly glo global and diverse workforce. Okay, now we live in very special times at the moment. We are just out of a pandemic where there's uh, a global uncertainty. Uh, around economics and so on and so on. So special times. So how would you describe the, the, the most important changes and drivers for change 
in Allianz as, as a business? And then as a, as a follow-up on that, how is, how is business responding to these, uh, to these challenges today? Uh, you're absolutely right. The current uh, geopolitical situation, economic situation, pandemics, endemics, put a lot of pressure, inflation mm -hmm. as well, of course, as a result, they put a lot of pressure on large and small enterprises. And of course, um, customers uh, have ever increasing expectations of mm -hmm. um, alliance and of insurance. They would like to have their insurance products highly tailored, customized, personalized for them. They would like to have access to our products and services at any time, uh, any device, uh, any convenient place they would like to do. So we have to provide them with more flexibility. The market is becoming increasingly competitive with a lot of new companies coming in, uh, fintechs, insurtechs, etc., who focus on the single product sometimes to provide that best customer experience. But on the other hand, they don't have those legacy um, legacy technology, a legacy operational setup. And I have to say, Allianz has been operating sin since 1890. So as you can imagine, we have some uh, technical uh, inheritance, I if I imagine, could put yeah. it this way. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So therefore, it. Uh, but also we have an enormous knowledge of our customers. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think we also have uh, uh, really eye on the innovation. We are financially very stable company as well because our clients are very loyal and we manage to find the right position for us in the market. And many markets were number one. Yeah. And not only because of the price, but also because customers see the best service from us. They stick to us. They see a lot of flexibility. And as you know, the needs of the customers have changed drastically recently. They want to pay only for what they use, for example. And therefore, mm -hmm. we are using innovative insurance products. We're also using innovative technology to uh, detect fraud as well. We're using innovative technology technology to make our claims processing faster, to, to process the documents and also make the customer experience really a delightful experience. And that mm -hmm. makes all of the difference. Yeah. So it's a, it's a transformation of the business that's, that's needed uh, to stay competitive and to uh, continue to enlighten uh, the, the, the customer uh, and give them the best experience, which for, um, I mean, the insurance experience is not something that you're looking for. Uh, it's, it's only in a case of damage that you have this experience. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's a special word in, in, uh, in world insurance as well. So tell me a little bit about the challenges for technology then, because that means that uh, in such a huge organization, you have to put in platforms and systems and, 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 uh, and an organization to support this transformation that the, that the business is going through, right? Absolutely. And I think I also uh, would like to mention other aspects and challenges like uh, security uh, challenges, which have been recently over the last years increasing quite significantly. So we need to make sure we provide very robust, agile and mm -hmm. secure technology to our businesses, being able to meet the and exceed the customer expectations and make our businesses competitive and also cost efficient as well. Yeah. So so in order to transform technology in a way that business really needs, we actually defined a strategy which is based on five bold moves. And let me just maybe list all of those, which mm -hmm. will allow, allow you perhaps to understand a little bit further what we are focusing on. Um, the first one is to ensure that we have uh, absolute stability with um, zero impact business outages and also applying zero trust security. When I'm talking about zero impact business outages, we all have to admit even hyperscalers, they do have um, uh, technical incidents, they do yeah. happen. But the idea is to make sure that your technology as resilient as possible so it becomes a non-business event. So you have resilience, failover or other technologies in place which 
quickly step in when incident occurs so the business doesn't have any impact. So it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we would like to be um, an agile company and we are going through a massive uh, reorganization process at the moment to ensure that we can bring the minimal viable product, or I call it the minimal lovable product, to the customers quickly and work with the customers already in the early stages of development so that we really bring personalized, tailored solutions to our customers in the most agile and fast and cost-effective way. Um, the other topic, which is another focus, which is really relevant to us, is to become an employer of choice, mm -hmm. to attract, develop, retain the best talents we can uh, we can bring to the company. And I think in the current situation, we were talking earlier about trends in the situation where the war for talent is huge and we have seen a lot of new trends emerging and the great resignation wave and um, you know, the market which is really hungry for specific skills like cloud skills, security skills, it's not an easy, an easy shift and an easy task to do. So that's, that's our third objective. It's, uh, and our fourth objective is also to provide new capabilities uh, as, as provide our applications as software as a service and also embrace very actively our cloud technologies to make the business more flexible, faster, more cost efficient and use all of the benefits the cloud technologies provide. And last but not least, we would like to ensure that our IT brings a lot of value. We even talk about IT economics about in the company. It's not just about cost income ratio and cost efficiency, but it's also how do you use IT to improve productivity? How do you use IT to make the, uh, to make our solutions uh, more flexible, uh, more personalized, more agile, more user-friendly. So IT really brings a lot of value, not just from cost-income ratio, but also from making our company more profitable, our margins stronger, and also our customers delighted as well. And wanting and willing to buy more uh, more products from us rather than from our competitors because our products would be more suitable for them yeah. and the experience overall is much, much better than elsewhere they can get. Okay, so stability, agility, being the employer of choice, new cloud uh, capabilities and then econ IT economics. I mean, five Correct. major focus points of the organization. Tell us a little bit more about uh, your role in the organization, your head of, of infrastructure and, and, and information security. And now we can see how that relates to the five the five focus points, right? Well, of course, you know, stability of the infrastructure is the foundation of trust with yep. our clients, both mm -hmm. internal and external, because without stability, you know, nothing else happens, to be honest, and we don't have the right to sit at the table with our businesses even. So stability of the infrastructure, providing stable service, keeping the lights on, you know, it's, it's extremely important. And we only hear noise when, you know, something doesn't work. And I think when it is quiet, it's, it's the best time, I would say. Though it might sound controversial, but I'm sure many colleagues who work in, in IT, they would, uh, they, they are with me on yeah. that. So stability, and I'm sponsoring stability across all of the Alliance technology. And we spend a lot of time with the clients to understand what are the critical components of their business business to ensure we provide full resilience to those uh, business components and business operations. We make sure that uh, if incidents happen, they are non-business events, as I said earlier, etc. So it's extremely important to have that robust infrastructure. Uh, secondly, uh, I think also cloudification, and I will talk maybe a little bit later mm -hmm. if the opportunity arises about the future cloud platform program. Uh, and there, I would like to say that we are providing the foundation for our applications, moving from legacy applications to um, cloud and software as a service applications. We 
which are more agile, which can scale up and down as businesses need at the much more, uh, much more cost efficient and cost effective way. So that's where infrastructure comes as well. We consolidated our data centers uh, over the number of years and we are massively moving to the cloud, both from the infrastructure, but also from the applications perspective. Mm -hmm. um, zero trust security is another big initiative which we are working on and it's moving from the perimeter security to actually identifying each time the user goes to a particular asset to use a particular resource it's never trust always verify mm -hmm. and that minimizes the um, it minimizes the uh, security perimeter you know quite significantly and maximizes the security it, it really strengthens the security posture quite a lot and mm -hmm. security is also part of my role we have seen a lot of pressure um, recently in in this area um, the team is really very strong we are exchanging a lot of experience also within the industry and also within peer groups as well which is enormous uh, help to us as well we're using the best of breed products to ensure our business is protected because our customers try Trust us with the most, you know, sensitive information that might be. So we feel very much, you know, responsible for 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 secure for keeping that information robust and keeping it secure as well. Um, in terms of agility, as I mentioned, we are as we speak, we are moving to chapters and tribes okay. to really work with um, applications and business colleagues faster and bring those products to our customers in a much more efficient, effective, and tailored way. Um, in addition to that, I think in terms of employer of choice, we are not only working and providing the right benefits or remuneration, but we're also trying to provide the best experience because I think a lot of a lot of people now are interested to work in technology companies, but I think we are providing the opportunity not only to work with the latest technologies, but also to work within the industry, mm -hmm. to apply real use cases uh, to technology and to apply technology to real use cases, which I think makes quite a lot of difference as well. If um, if, if you ask. And, and of course, uh, the last but not least, we need to provide that experience, as I mentioned, in the cost efficient, cost effective way, bring value from IT perspective to make our business more competitive. We are looking at, uh, we are applying actively rather than looking at, we are applying actively process mining, robotic process automation, so that our employees and our agents working with the clients can focus on really value added activities. Mm -hmm. rather than admin related or low level operational tasks. So there is quite a lot which my team is doing and we are just maybe around between uh, two, two and a half, between two and a half and three thousand people strong team. Why mm -hmm. I don't give you the exact number is because we're going through this gear shift program and we're adding more and more colleagues. So I expect we would be around three thousand people very, very soon. So it's quite a large team. So just infrastructure and information security is, is two thousand five hundred, three thousand people. Wow. Yes. That's, uh, that's, that's quite amazing. So let's let's talk about the your cloud strategy. What's the situation today, today and where do you want to go with cloud and, and, and where do you see the, the major benefits? Because you talked about cost benefits, but not if I talk to other CIOs, not everybody is convinced that cloud necessary is cost effective or, or, the, or, the, or the most cost effective way. So there's many, many things to unpack here. So, but let's start with your, with your cloud strategy. What's your vision and where are you today? Um, we are working both with um, uh, AWS and Microsoft Azure, mm -hmm. and uh, we are also uh, we have done quite a lot of progress on the infrastructure side with the infrastructure workloads, and we are doing a lot of work with the applications now, both from the perspective of defining the strategies and business case for the legacy applications to move to the cloud, but also mm -hmm. building our own um, platforms, which are SaaS platforms, which provide more flexibility, more, uh, as I said, economies of scale, 
uh, OPEX versus CAPEX, mm -hmm. uh, and also more stability. Yes, you're right when you asked whether, you know, a lot of CIOs and IT colleagues don't see the uh, necessarily the benefits uh, to the cloud from the cost perspective. Mm -hmm. I think we need to look at, at the cost-benefit analysis from the perspective not of the pure IT, but what are the benefits for the business. And if the cloud allows you to get rid of a lot of legacy applications to move to the much more efficient platforms, if it allows you to decrease the um, operational expenses because you are now doing more automation, uh, you, you don't need to spend money on the maintenance as well. So you can mm -hmm. focus on innovation as well, building uh, and supporting new channels. Then I think it makes quite a lot of difference because you need to look at it in the kind of bigger picture perspective rather than just pure IT. Because I think what we have seen, and I have spoken to a lot of my industry peers and IT colleagues, um, they do see that the mainframe and data center costs, they're going down, but they're not, they're more flattening rather than going down because there is still quite a bit of legacy. There is still quite a lot to be done. And also there are considerations that you don't move to the cloud, whether it's for latency, regulatory perspective, or you know, other other reasons. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, you know, the cloud provider is not there in that ge geography yet or not far enough to allow you proper disaster recovery and business continuity set up. So therefore, the pure business case, which is based on IT only, doesn't work. You're right. I have never seen anything, you know, which, mm -hmm. which indicates a very positive business case on infrastructure only. It has to be considered as part of the bigger picture and it has to be supported like it is with us. It is to be supported from the strategic point of view by the board and by the business users as well who see the benefits of that on, in their everyday work. Okay, now let's talk a bit about your, I mean, you're, you're going through this major cloud transformation and, and your future cloud platform program is, is a key enabler there. Why don't you tell me all about that, uh, about that program? Uh, Future Cloud Platform um, started with um, a group of about 30 people or so in 2019. Uh, we uh, previously to that for about five or six years, we worked really hard to consolidate our data centers. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have um, several like major pairs of data centers in our main regions. Uh, but at the same time, we also realized that cloud provides a lot of opportunities and benefits, which we discussed earlier. So future cloud platform is really about uh, moving the uh, moving the infrastructure and uh, applications to the cloud. It's about uh, moving the uh, uh, catalog of services, which our, uh, our technology and our operating entities could use, you know, almost in the automated fashion. So mm -hmm. it's deploying the cloud capabilities uh, much faster. It's also working with the application colleagues um, in the application cloudification factory, where we actually determine what is the route to the cloud for each of our major applications, because uh, sometimes answer is not just lift and shift. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we drop and shop. Sometimes we rehost, sometimes we reprogram, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think for us, it's really providing the future cloud platform from the infrastructure perspective. It's providing the foundation mm -hmm. of for our businesses to and for our operating entities as well as the central IT to get the access to cloud services very fast, to deploy very fast and to use the catalog of the services and configure it in a way, mm -hmm. in a flexible way, which is required to launch fast and deploy fast and respond to the specific business needs. So it's um, this program is still ongoing. We have mm -hmm. a lot of ambition, as I said, 75% of our applications in the cloud by 2025. And that includes both uh, the uh, applications in the um, operating entities, as well as the central applications and tooling. So it's quite quite a large program and we have moved from stride to stride and mm -hmm. we're already seeing a lot of benefits with that. And do you see a 100% cloud future uh, on the horizon? Is, is, is that the goal or that's not important? That's that's. Uh, 
I think uh, not not maybe 100 percent, mm-hmm. but maybe 80, 75, 80 percent, because not everything is suitable for the mm-hmm. cloud, I would say. There are regulatory constraints in many countries we work, or at least for now, so which require us to keep the data uh, on the premise mm-hmm. or in our data centers to have uh, control, um, full control and access to that. We also, it also requires us to ensure that uh, we also have the right business setup because sometimes if you move to the cloud, you might lose uh, latency, and mm-hmm. though we don't necessarily are uh, the trading company <laughs> or investment bank, we have businesses like uh, credit insurance, which uh, uh, which actually brings a significant share of revenues via APIs, and therefore the latency is of essence here. Important. And therefore, you know, in some some cases the cloud is the answer. In some cases, we have the applications in the in front of the actuary who is running those applications mm-hmm. in you know real time and need to do it quickly. So sometimes latency could be of an issue. And sometimes in some of our countries, we're still waiting for hyperscalers to come and build the capabilities. They simply are not there yet okay. or will be there soon so that we can have our, um, you know, so that we can be sure that uh, uh, disaster recovery capabilities are there, that the um, data which needs to be within the region is there. So we're still waiting for the hyperscalers basically to come to yeah. some of the territories. So and, there you, are. Yeah. and you're working both with Amazon and, and, and with Microsoft uh, Azure. So so yes. what is your strategy to, to avoid <laughs> vendor lock-in? Because I mean, we will always be locked in one way or another, but so how do you make sure that you stay as independent as possible from, uh, from the providers? Um, Firstly, it's the dual cloud strategy already Mm -hmm. provides a healthy level of the competition. Uh, We are also looking at uh, at working with uh, uh, those providers in uh, partnership, um, not just um, you know using them as a service, but also working with them in different aspects of our business. So we, uh, with one, we will work on our global data platform, for example. With others, we are bringing our um, our uh, enterprise platforms uh, to the cloud. So we are we are using the best of breed. Uh, for the specific use cases with mm-hmm. them. So I think yes, you're right. You cannot completely move away from vendor lock-in, but we have a very capable uh, procurement team as well, which helps us a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also are looking at the innovative um, approaches like uh, uh, joint um, initiatives, uh, partnering in particular areas in terms of providing more efficient financing, faster time to market. Um, also, we are getting quite adventurous, I would say, within the constraints we have, of course, in our uh, commercial arrangements with those um, suppliers with the help of our very capable procurement team. So Mm -hmm. we're using various levers, not just to be, you know, dependent completely on one or another technology. And actually, recently, we were discussing how do we actually work together with other large companies, large and small actually, Mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that we are also providing significant, you know, we're seen not as just one important client, but we're seen as a group of important clients and um, sort of working on the equal terms Mm -hmm. with those hyperscalers. So we I think the next to come, in my view, is when the enterprises who are using separately um, cloud services will actually work together to get more benefits um, and economies of scale from from the hyperscalers. So we are talking about that. You mentioned data and that we have to watch out what data is on prem and, 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 and that we can put in the cloud and so on. So let's, I mean, a, a, a hot topic at the moment and it's getting hotter every day apparently is data sovereignty. So, so, so can, we, can you talk a little bit about that? How, what's, what's your vision? Where do you see the opportunity, the challenges there? I think uh, for insurance business, data is everything. It's the blood and bone of our business. So it's extremely important for us because uh, we are 
yes, data is our business in a way. Um, and it defines how we um, price our products, what products we uh, develop for the future, how we address the demands in the market, many aspects. And uh, as you said, data sovereignty and uh, the regulation around data starting from GDPR and more recent, you know, developments, you need mm -hmm. to be extremely, um, extremely careful, uh, especially if you have sensitive data and we have the multitude of regulations we're working across, etc. So I think in that respect, we already, you know, work a lot with our regulators and show them that we have controls of where the data is uh, residing, how it is used, who has access to that data, because in certain jurisdictions you cannot access data from another jurisdiction. I've seen it, for example, in Middle East. I have seen it as in other locations. So, And I think hyperscalers as well, they are already you know, very well adjusting to this. They have their spe specific regulatory expertise or regulatory expert teams who work with us mm -hmm. to ensure exactly um, that they meet our requirements where the data resides, where it can travel to, how it is used, who has access to that, etc. So there are, there are technologies already which allow you uh, to do that, to have certain control around your data, quite strict controls, encryption as well on both sides, on the side of the provider and on our side as well, but also insurance business, and as you have seen it in banking as well, is moving towards ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of internal and external data as well. So yeah. that brings extra challenges as well. While we are defining, we're very strict and very protective with our data, who can use it, how it can be accessed, how long it can be retained, etc. We are also working and using through the ecosystems, we are using external data as well. And here we also need to be cognizant uh, of how this data is managed, how it's used, etc. So we're working in partnerships with various ecosystem players to ensure that we have end-to-end -end data protection, encryption, security, etc. But with regards to sovereignty, I suppose it's it's a quite a complex subject, mm -hmm. and we are very um, we are really very focused on providing the right controls, the right understanding of the regulatory requirements around the data, the right access controls to the data, etc. The right retention and retrieval policies. We're getting where necessary and important, of course, we're getting everywhere the customer consent of using certain channels for the data. So it's an insurance as though data is the fuel, but also data could be to, in a way, a constraint. And therefore, mm -hmm. we need to ensure that our controls and our access to the data absolutely and security are absolutely robust. So and we demand that from our providers as well. OK, great. Let's talk about uh, a second grade program that you and, and your teams have been working on, and that's, that's your software-defined wide area networks. Give me a bit of the context. What are, what are we talking about, and, 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 and how, do you, how have you transformed your, uh, your wants? Uh, Software-defined wide area network uh, transformation started in uh, 2019 mm -hmm. and since then we already have, as of end of June, we have 1,000 offices in software defined wide area network. Mm -hmm. What what is it? It's actually using virtualization, automation and cloud technologies, which allow you to basically uh, decouple the traffic from the um, underlying network and you can use the direct access to internet, for example, use different types of uh, uh, network, you can use MPLS, you can use broadband, you can use other, you know, resources, and you can direct um, those resources to the most business critical applications, for example. Mm -hmm. It gives you much better bandwidth, up to 30% better bandwidth, uh, better security, and up to 30% less costs. So I think it allows, but from the, from the business perspective, it allows the businesses to grow without adding more complexity and without uh, additional costs, basically in a much more uh, cost-optimized way. Mm 
So I think in that respect, software-defined networks give you more flexibility, better cost, much mm -hmm. better cost actually, and much better security as well. So using automation, virtualization and cloud as well. So it, it has been quite a journey for us because mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to reduce dependency on MPLS networks. We wanted to ensure that we have much more cost efficient solution. We wanted to ensure that the businesses can grow without adding complexity to our infrastructure. That's why software defined wide area network was one part of the big part of the transformation of our uh, Alliance global network space. Mm -hmm. And I think from that perspective, we can see already that a lot of businesses are getting a lot of benefits from that and that makes their cost income ratios lower, it makes their businesses more competitive, faster, more flexible. And as I said, we still have a, a way to go, but we already are probably about 80-90% um, complete. Okay. And I think from COVID perspective, you know, we many companies had to stop those activities because uh, introducing uh, software defined wide area networks requires a lot of change, re requires a lot of presence on the ground mm -hmm. uh, during the projects. And we actually persevered and we really during the last two years in particular, we have made a really huge progress for which I'm really grateful for all the teams and the businesses can see benefits Benefit and coming out of the, well, I hope coming out of the COVID uh, situation, mm -hmm. uh, businesses are ready uh, for growth, businesses are ready for more competitive, you know, cost income ratio perspective, uh, more flexible, more secure, more stable. And that's what software defined uh, wide area networks give you as from, from technology and from business perspective. Okay. So you mentioned cost as an important uh, driver in, in, in these projects. In, in general, the budgets, are, are they under pressure? I mean, or is this a, is a constant thing that, that you need to do more with less? And, and, and yes, es so especially now that potentially we're going into, uh, are we, we're coming into uh, a more uh, precious economic climate, let's call it. So. <laughs> So that, does that mean there's more pressure on the, on the cost and the budget at the moment, or you don't see that yet? Yes, we of course we see a lot of pressure, especially with the inflation going up. In some countries like UK, uh, it's projected to be 11%. Um, in Europe, maybe slightly lower, but still quite big numbers, 6 7% in the mm -hmm. US, I have heard. So it's quite significant. And even you know the most stable companies, financially stable companies, they are taking really focus on. They take. They are putting a lot of attention on the cost, and as technology, you know, we're one of the buckets, not <laughs> the the single bucket, but one of the an areas one, which. Yeah. An important one, of course, which experiences a lot of pressure in that respect. And we're working tirelessly to optimize our uh, infrastructure, our technology, to ensure we get rid of the assets which are not used. We are uh, looking at the, like with SD-WAN, for example, are looking at the much more uh, stable, uh, resilient, and importantly, cost-efficient solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also looking, we're working very actively with each of the operating entities to look what is critical for them and what is less critical in terms of uh, what is really needed to tailor our technology offerings to their needs rather than provide everything to everybody because it inflates costs. And mm -hmm. of course, that creates a certain challenge because on the one hand, we want to provide standardized solutions. On the other hand, not all of the operating entities need everything. No. And therefore, you need to balance the economies of scale. You need to balance the uh, stability uh, topic, but we never compromise on stability and security, and we need to balance what are the pressures in in the market for this particular business. Mm -hmm. So what they can be, you know, what is absolutely necessary, what is the priority, and what is what they can live with or without, so yeah. to speak. So I think we are doing a lot of individual work with many operating entities to review how we can optimize further the 
uh, the uh, cost income ratios with the help of technology, how we can get rid of the expensive legacy, how we can accelerate move to the cloud, how we can use innovative, more cost efficient and cost effective technologies. We're working with our vendors and partners, of course, we're pushing a bit of pressure on them, yeah. as you know, and I think everyone does. Um, so yes, it's, it, it is a big topic and a big challenge and our CFOs are very, both in Alliance Technology, but but also in Alliance Group, uh, very, um, uh, you know, they challenge us on the uh, weekly, monthly basis and our operating entities, you know, it's always, you know, everyday work with them. And I have to say we are making some good progress. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk a bit about how IT digital is, is organized in, in, in Alliance. So, Allianz, more than 150,000 people, many different business units around uh, all, all different sports of insurance, let's, uh, let's call it. And then you have uh, Allianz Technology. So is Allianz Technology the only provider of, of IT services to the Allianz Group or how is that relationship? So um, Allianz Technology, as I mentioned earlier, is the operating entity uh, which provides technology services to uh, majority actually of the operating entities within the group. Mm -hmm. So we provide um, data center and cloud services, network services, workplace services, information security. And I also mentioned we're going through the project called GearShift where we are consolidating the uh, technology from the operating entities to the central team. So this is a large, very large uh, multi-year program mm -hmm. and we already moved technology from uh, operating entities it is in Germany, in France, and Benelux, and some other countries already are becoming part of Allianz technology. But of course, we also have um, some of the technology within operating entities. Mm -hmm. Some require, um, you know, because some of the entities and many of they have local applications, they have local support teams as well. But we are consolidating that as we speak. And of course, um, Allianz Group is uh, is quite heterogeneous genius group it has quite a number of different entities and we also acquired a few over the last few years like Liverpool Victoria like uh, others as well and those entities uh, they still might have their own technology but we are uh, on the roadmap how we actually integrate those technologies over months or maybe years sometimes if it is a complex you know big company how do we actually um, how do we consolidate over the time? But um, at the moment, uh, there is a lot of effort going on in terms of the consolidation, but there are also some of the entities which still have their own setups, but mm -hmm. we are moving to a uh, more centralized approach. And I think it provides actually better stability as we have seen. It provides economies of scale. It provides the benefits to the employees as well, because they can choose career paths within Allianz technology, not feeling isolated within the entities sometimes. So I think it is it is a good initiative. So Okay. And so then the let's say the, the development teams and, and, and the digital teams and and the software teams, they're still in the operating unit then? Actually, we have, within Allianz Technology, we have um, infrastructure um, and information security. Mm -hmm. uh, um, then we also have business applications team, which uh, provides enterprise uh, applications, services okay. to the rest of operating entities. We also have a global system integration team, which integrates local applications with a global setup. Right. So therefore, we have, um, uh, I would say that the majority of services are already central, but we also have the local teams in place, uh, which uh, provide support for local applications and in some cases also provide support for uh, workplace services as well. So um, therefore, that consolidation is uh, ongoing, but for majority of the central staff, it's, it's already within within Allianz Technology and with GearShift, we are moving pretty much everything to okay. the center. And your clients then are the different entities in the, in the Allianz Group? And you only service the Allianz Group, you're not serving any, any other companies and that's also 
not the strategy then, or how, how is that? Uh, yes, we uh, have a lot on our hands already. <laughs> we have uh, we have many uh, operating entities, and some of them are what we call global lines or global businesses operating in multiple countries themselves. Mm -hmm. So therefore, our major initiative to be the tech partner of choice for operating entities within Alliance Group, mm -hmm. and. Um, well, later on, who knows, maybe, yeah. uh, maybe, but um, I think we are really focusing on providing the uh, excellent service to within the group, and okay. then we will see. Clear. So tell me more about, uh, I mean, you have a large team, 2,500, growing to 3,000 people. How, how is that team organized? How, how do you operate a, a, a big team like that? Um, this team um, is organized, it's uh, spread across multiple locations mm -hmm. and while, you know, in the past um, uh, Ali and while Allianz is uh, headquartered in um, Germany, we are a very international company mm -hmm. and, um, for example, my team, we have, I have about uh, 400 people or so in Germany because it's still supporting a very large operating entity, uh, but I also have teams in France France, in Spain, um, basically pretty much in, in the US, um, pretty much everywhere in the world. But we also have very large teams in the uh, offshore locations. We have um, many, probably majority of our team based in India. We have also set up in Thailand um, and, um, and also in Eastern Europe as well, like Hungary, for example, and so on. So it's, it's quite a distributed team, though I would say the centers of gravity, in a way, are still quite a bit in Germany and in India as well. Okay. And so and, and it must be a, f a fascinating world, but at the, at, the, at, the, at the same time, I can imagine that tra attracting the people is not an easy thing. Uh, it, insurance doesn't have the, the, the sexiness as, as maybe uh, high-tech uh, companies have, uh, and, and infrastructure not necessary either. So, so uh, you talked that uh, employee um, being an employer of choice is one of your focus points. So tell us a little bit your programs around that. How do you make sure um, that, that Allianz Technology and your group is an attractive employer? And, and why is it that people that are watching this video, why should they come and work with you? That's, that's an excellent question. And of course, you know, we're always welcoming uh, the talents and Allianz Technology. Um, you're absolutely right. Being a, an employer of choice, it actually means quite a few things. It means that uh, you provide good experience to your employees, uh, not, uh, not only when they start working with you, but through the whole kind of cycle process, you from, from actually interviewing and hiring, through providing the right benefits, uh, providing the right uh, work-life balance, providing interesting, stimulating work, providing upskilling and reskilling, and providing really uh, an agile environment which allows employees to actually apply their skills in their best possible way, to have the right culture, not culture of micromanagement and control, but the culture of innovation and creativity, culture focused on high performance, but also culture focused on opportunities. And what we have seen is there is quite a big shift from people um, focusing on career management, on focusing on their lifestyle management, mm -hmm. right? So therefore, you know, we, we have a number of initiatives which we are working on like hybrid working, uh, enhancing our workplace for people to come and work together as teams, but also enabled from technology perspective to work in the hybrid way. We are looking at uh, constantly uh, providing the opportunities for our people to upskill and reskill themselves because technology moves with an enormous pace and we have excellent, excellent programs. I can vouch it for myself, both on the soft skills, but also in technology skills. So I think it won't be right to say soft skills because the communication, collaboration are, I would call them core skills yep. in the current environment, especially, especially hybrid environment. So for example, we um, 
have um, a lot of programs around uh, mental strength and resilience and well-being, but also highly technical issues like certifications in Microsoft and AWS technologies. So you you choose. So and we also have seen uh, from employee perspective, what is really important is to create um, an environment where there are opportunities to grow and develop internally, where there are opportunities to um, uh, to work on innovative projects and actually would be surprised, but in Forbes, if I remember correctly, uh, we were in the top a few companies um, which uh, were considered the innovative companies uh, in the world because we have uh, actually implemented one of the uh, probably most uh, extensive blockchain uh, programs uh, to deal with our claims processing. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't probably think about uh, Alliance or insurance as big blockchain, yeah. you know, uh, adopters, but here we are. So we are, I, th I suppose we, our strength gives us the uh, resources and um, our culture gives us the determination to innovate. Uh, we also have uh, entities within Allianz, like Allianz X, for example, focusing on investing mm -hmm. in the new technologies okay. as well. So, so we have multiple levers and we have innovation community and so on. So I think there are multiple opportunities, but also we have other initiatives like making sure that we have um, diversity and inclusion initiatives, and I mean diversity from multiple perspectives, not just gender, but also all the different experiences people bring. Um, secondly, we're also looking at, um, and we are, we are very, you know, well advanced on equal pay initiatives mm -hmm. as well. We're looking at additional incentives for our employees, um, uh, long term and short term, and it doesn't always go into the the, um, you know, into the financials. It also goes to the culture. It, go, it goes uh, to the engagement of employees. It goes to celebrating successes. It, mm -hmm. And we had, like, two weeks ago, we had the uh, awesome week together, and we celebrated promotions, um, you know, for the year. We had uh, board members of Alliance Technology serving ice cream to people, so we make it fun <laughs> as well. Okay. And so you, you, you manage large, large teams all over the globe. So, so how would you describe your management style? How, what is your secret of making sure you can attract and retain and have the right people and make them successful? Um, I think there are multiple aspects to uh, the management and leadership style. First is to uh, to have the vision and to bring people to that vision with you. Uh, with you. And I mentioned like five bold moves of our strategy. Mm -hmm. We're very explicit about it. We make pitches to our people and we always check with people. Is it something which resonates with you? Is it resonating with the customers? Is it relevant, etc.? But I think from the management style, it's definitely it's collaboration, it's trust. So the value of trust is extremely important. We're a very collaborative company, so we like to swarm around the problems and resolve them. I think also, as personally, for my style, I think my team would say that I, uh, I'm honest and direct. Mm -hmm. uh, I also implement the blameless culture because I think my philosophy is to learn from mistakes and move on and to apply new knowledge, especially it's relevant to stability, root cause analysis, etc. Because once the incident happens, you learn from it, you move on and you don't make mistakes again, you move to the, you level up basically. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I think that is that is extremely important to point out because if employees are and our teams are feeling that they're adding value, and you keep them, you know, open and trusted, rather than, you know, blaming for something which happened because technology breaks occasionally. You know, we all live with that, right? It's about learning and moving forward. I think that's very important. So, trust, 
blameless culture, being very open and visionary, taking your people with you. And it's not about, again, I'm very much against micromanagement. And sometimes fire drills happen and we need to be very precise of how we fix the issues. But I think it's about anticipation. It's about responsibility, end-to-end -end accountability. And it's given people also, our employees, freedom to create, to explore, etc. So it's, 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 a, it's a balance of things. So to make people come to work with joy mm -hmm. rather than to drag their feet <laughs> to work. Right. So I think it's important. It's, it's, it's a culture. You kind of it's working with the teams. It's being open. It's also providing the limelight to the people who truly uh, who truly contribute. It's not about management being a bottleneck to, you know, to that. It's yep. actually giving your people the, the opportunity to showcase, to collaborate, to contribute. And I think that's that's very important. OK, that's how we build trust. Now, Natasha, I know you're very driven, you're very hardworking, and you put in uh, all the hours that, that are necessary and so on. So what is it that really drives you? When at the end of the week, when you take uh, time off with your family, when are you happy when you say this was a good week? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a difficult question because, <laughs> you know, my, when I look at my uh, diary or my working week, um, there are very different things we do, whether it is, you know, uh, employee appreciation and promotion celebration that these events I really like and it makes me really happy. Uh, sometimes it's resolving the issue really fast to make sure there is no disruption to the business. Having the client, you know, satisfied and being open with the with our clients about topics we have and issues we have to resolve. But for me, what drives me is really focusing on the outcomes, focusing on the positive outcomes and leaving the good legacy behind, right? Mm -hmm. And also maybe what I started being taken by other people as their own. So I'm happy to step away and, you know, this initiative or this, you know, technology to kind of live by itself. I think it's, it's probably the best testament to uh, testament to the adoption right so that that really when when you know things i started they start having their own life and they're embraced as they are by other people and they don't even know that i maybe was there or i initiated that that makes me really really happy and Yes, we have sometimes very long weeks. We have firefighting. But even with firefighting, once you resolve the issue, that gives mm -hmm. you quite a lot of satisfaction. But in a way, I think what drives me as well, all the new topics which come up all the time. So it's never dull. And <laughs> it's always new. It's always change, right? Yeah. And it's better, better, never best, if I could <laughs> formulate it that way, right? But... Uh, there is always an enormous opportunity to do a lot of different things and to really change things for the better for our employees, for our clients and for the society as well. Maybe it's another topic which I want to mention because we're doing a lot in the from sustainability perspective, from contributing to society, for actually shaping um, what, um, like working with the clients and working with the partners, shaping uh, initiatives like sustainability, diversity, diversity and many others contributing, giving back to society. I think the fifth industrial revolution, you know, we were talking about the uh, industrial revolutions, etc. The fifth one, uh, the fourth one was about di digitalization, but mm -hmm. I think the fifth one is when big companies like ours can give back and contribute back to society. And I think that's extremely important. And we're doing a lot in our initiatives um, for sustainability, both internally and externally. And I think actually going beyond and above your enterprise boundaries, that is probably another driver for me because big companies like ours can make a tremendous impact to the, to the you know, for the good to the society as well. Okay, interesting. The fifth industrial uh, revolution, or um, that's, that's an, an, an interesting new concept for me. Thank you for that. So, Natasha, I want to uh, deep dive a little bit more into your character and who you are as a, as a leader, who you are as a person. And you shared with us that your MBTI profile is that you are an ENFJ, a protagonist. And, and a protagonist is a person with extroverted, intuitive feeling and judging personality traits. And these are typically warm, forthright, 
four tribe types that love to help others and they tend to have strong ideas and values and they back their perspective with creative energy um, to achieve their goals. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a couple of typical strengths of people with your profile and you let me know which one uh, stands out for you where you really recognize yourself and then we do the same thing with, with weaknesses. So uh, protagonist ENFJs typically have the, uh, the following strengths. They are very receptive, they are very reliable, they uh, can be very passionate, uh, altruistic and charismatic. So out of these, which one would you say, yes, that, that I, I recognize myself in that, and can you maybe uh, uh, dwell a bit on that? Um, I would say that um, definitely uh, reliable, mm -hmm. that's for sure, and um, energetic in pursuing the goals. Um, uh, and I think maybe, as I mentioned earlier, when you asked me about my career, um, Accenture kind of shaped it. Uh, in me, in terms of teamwork, being very customer focused, being very reliable, because when you start your working career with a certain expectations and the quality of what you deliver and your level of, you know, service uh, to the customers, and you put quite a lot of standards to yourselves and to others, right? So uh, for me, I I really uh, put a lot of focus on being reliable in producing high quality outcomes with a customer focus. I think that is really important. And I go for it with a lot of energy. Okay. Great. <laughs> to be honest. Natasha, we talked about your strengths, but let's also talk about the, uh, the typical weaknesses of, uh, of people with the protagonist uh, personality. and and. Potential weaknesses are that they can be unrealistic, they can be overly idealistic, sometimes they're condescending, uh, talking down on people, they can be very intense or overly empathetic. Which one of these do you say, yes, that, that I recognize myself in that, and, which, and how did you overcome these weaknesses maybe? Because you can't be uh, condescending on people when you lead a big team like that, for instance. Well, I, I'm actually never condescending. <laughs> so I was a little bit uh, surprised by that. I, I suppose maybe um, experience is gained with um, years of, of work and seeing it all. And sometimes, you know, people can make fast judgments or fast uh, conclusions. I'm typically not like that. I maintain very flat structure and everybody is, a, I consider everyone in the team as a partner mm -hmm. rather than subordinate, yeah. for example, because we're all in it together. We're all in the same boat, right? So therefore, I would say that for me, um, you mentioned like being overly empathetic. Sometimes, you know, it comes like one of the, uh, I w you can call it weakness or not. Sometimes, you know, I, I can come across as having my heart on my sleeve, mm -hmm. so to speak. And I think maybe for female in IT, it's not always, you know, a good thing. <laughs> Sometimes you, you make a decision, yeah. even if you don't agree with it, you made a decision, you commit, right? And I think I started becoming more uh, firm in that approach. Once the decision is made, you commit, you don't spend a lot of time, um, you know, discussing. Yeah. Sometimes the discussion is necessary, but once you know, the decision is made, you need to move on. So I think I'm, I'm working on the uh, heart on the sleeve <laughs> thing to be kind of more resolute sometimes because it could be a waste, waste of time occasionally, you know, when you spend too much time deliberating. Okay. Let's right, you need to cut and move. Let's go one level deeper and, and, and talk about your core values because I'm, I'm convinced that uh, very successful digital leaders like yourself I mean, they're wired uh, thinking in, the, in, in different ways than, than average digital leaders. And so I want to find out what makes you special. And we talked about your personality, but I also think your values and, 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 and your core values are very Im in, important to, uh, to be successful as a professional. So I know you've shared with, uh, with us that you have a son who is uh, 14 years old and who loves to, uh, to play table tennis. Um, so. What are the, the core values that you want to pass on to him? What is it that you live by and you want to see 
your son uh, to live by? Well, I think uh, trust and integrity is probably trust as value number one, mm -hmm. because as I said, without trust, nothing happens. So it's being uh, honest, right? Uh, and that's very important. Another thing is doing things well and really committing or not doing things at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important. That's what I tell my son as well. Either don't do it if you feel half-hearted about it. Doesn't always come with homework, but so that's <laughs> maybe an exception. But, you know, once you, once, you know, you decide to do something, do it properly. Don't waste your time doing it half-heartedly. Mm -hmm. And also be useful. Be of use to people. Yep. That's very important, right? And uh, be of service to people. I think it's, it's very, very important as well. Now, being also have fun being you know generous have sense of humor you know i think that you know extra extrovert ex aspect you know socializing expert uh, uh, you know aspect it's it's quite important because though um the teenagers you know children they're all in their screens mm -hmm. i think in the hybrid world the communication and collaboration is extremely important yeah. and whatever means they use i'm open to that and also i think another one is maybe choosing your battles because when i was um, mother of a younger child you know i wanted everything perfect but <laughs> over the time i've learned that you need to choose your battles because otherwise you waste all of your resources Sources and you will not achieve any of the gains, right? But I think also maybe another one is don't don't be afraid to surround yourself with the experts and people who know because you cannot know everything and that i use in my professional work i i cannot pretend that i am you know a deep security expert mm -hmm. in you know in penetration you know hacking or whatever just an example or you know i would rather bring the right expert and i've learned i will learn from that expert i will not be afraid maybe i'm a good manager but i'm not a good exp expert in particular technology mm -hmm. so don't be afraid to surround yourself with the experts and work as a team there is nothing wrong with it and i think there is nothing wrong to be prepared and to be ambitious right just i think you need to do it in the um ethical way as well so um, because what sometimes you see that people are very focused on their career and they can be blindfolded how they go to it i think you need to be empathetic to people you need to see what's going around you you need to see how your actions impact other people i think it's very important but i think number one is certainly trust number two is focus on you know do things well or don't don't do them at all you know that's that and be of service and be of use to people who do you look up to and who, who are the important mentors of your life mm, i look uh, what i look up to is um really the ability of uh, those important people and important mentors their leadership ability um, and how i can enhance mine further i look at their insight i look at their uh, ease of dealing with complex issues and taking people with them as well um, and maybe trained or seeming is to resolve issues fast mm -hmm. as well and bring everyone with with them because very often we um, have we might have contradictory views and i think the true leader authentically brings people around the uh, vision and then once people commit they execute fast it's the ability to bring everyone towards the jointly acceptable and jointly uh, uh, jointly uh, adopted solution. I think that that is very important to do it fast, to do it effective, to do it with uh, with a positive attitude yeah. as well. So Natasha, you're clearly very, very successful and many good things have happened in your life, but not life is not always uh, a fairy tale and sometimes bad things happen to us. So would you, <coughs> would you uh, be so good to share maybe one of the the worst things that have happened to you in your life and, and how you overcome that, what you learned from that? Um, yes, I can do that. And of course, you know, very often we see only the best side of things and people don't normally share the, the setbacks. Um, some do, some don't. Um, but I'm happy to share one, perhaps. Um, when I was um, in Accenture, uh, when I started, 
I was assigned to a project uh, by mistake, to the project where I didn't have skills to deliver. Mm. I just simply was not trained. I didn't have the skill. And at the time, we didn't use sophisticated software. It was a spreadsheet of projects, uh, positions available. And the person who did the schedule, they used the ruler and they just rolled it down the sheet and said, OK, Natasha will work on this project. Uh, Peter will work on that one. And so the scheduler made a mistake. Her ruler went kind of sidewards. And I ended up on the project in the insurance company, actually, building the claims administration systems on mainframe, and my job was to do the design. Mm -hmm. And I just joined Accenture. I had the training on programming, testing, but not design yet. So I ended up in the system design role, and I had no clue. <laughs> And I ended up in Cheltenham. I was the only one from my start group working out of London. Uh, on Sunday, I got my uh, credit card uh, swallowed by ATM machine, so with five pounds in the pocket. So it was pretty disastrous, I have to say. And for the first maybe two or three months, I had no, you know, I tried to catch up of what I was supposed to do, desperately show in the front that everything is going well. And actually admiring people who were like seamlessly doing their work, you know, with no, uh, no interruption and producing good results. And I had no clue what, what, what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I even created some design system in my mind, but I was seriously thinking of that technology is not for me, I'm quitting. And, uh, but then gradually, I just started asking people to teach me. I spent some, it was, it were long 18 hour days sometimes, 16 hour days. So it was not much, you know, time to actually catch up on the personal stuff. So I really spent a bit of time on, asking people, getting as much help as I need to be. I, I, I opened up about my struggles and I, I was surprised how much help I actually got. And actually people managers realized I was there by mistake. I wasn't supposed to be there. It was not an imposter syndrome at that <laughs> time. It was really, I shouldn't have been there. So, uh, and you know, from that, I, after, you know, after, you know, that happened, I decided, I made the resolution that never ever I would be in the position to actually wait to be scheduled to a project, never. So what I did, I made friends with schedulers. I found out what projects were in the pipeline. I chose the ones which I was interested in. Mm -hmm. I went to the managers and kind of sold myself and my abilities and why I should be on this project. And I had pretty successful career afterwards, you know, because I actually started becoming more active in my career. And that was really, you know, a big lesson learned because I was literally a, an inch from quitting to actually completely changing the direction and doing what I really liked. Okay. So a big lesson. So Natasha, if you reflect back on your, maybe on your personal life as well, what is it that you are most grateful for? I think I'm most grateful for the opportunities which were given to me in my life, starting perhaps from my parents who invested in my education, uh, who um, showed me the way, you know, that I, you know, my mother who passed away last year was a role model for me. She was a rocket scientist, but she was very down to earth. She could speak to anyone and everyone and uh, find the common language. So she showed me, you know, the, what uh, a working uh, female is mm -hmm. and what uh, the and, and the importance of communication and also you know trying you know not to perhaps try to achieve though uh, i i'm a bit of a perfectionist but i also learned that you need to choose your battles sometimes mm -hmm. and sometimes 80 20 is better than uh, you know, trying to achieve 100 across multiple things and achieving 20, mm -hmm. right? So, so therefore, not not kind of spreading yourself too thinly. Uh, I'm also grateful for the um, opportunities. You know, when I grew up in Russia, Gorbachev came to power, and I was able to learn English. I was able to see the world. I was able to choose, you know, my profession. I suppose it's time and circumstances. I'm grateful to my teachers and to my mentors professionally as well, who taught me, who showed me, you know, the right and wrong things mm -hmm. not to do and to do. For example, um, in Deutsche Bank, I had um, one of the managers who 
gave me kind of average uh, performance evaluation and I was a little bit disappointed because I, th I was thinking I was doing a stellar job, everything was absolutely perfect, I was meeting and exceeding all the KPIs and yet it was kind of like average. So I asked him why was that and he said that doing your job well is kind of the foundation yep. but what you need to do is to look at the big picture, to look at the company, to challenge the strategy, to come with the solutions and you know since then I think that was another lesson learned that in order to kind of succeed career-wise you need to look beyond and above your immediate perimeter of work you need to look how your work contributes to the rest of the company and maybe even into the bigger picture and how you can influence the outcomes of this picture with your experience, with your input, and you can raise your voice and raise your hand and take, you know, different opportunities outside of your perimeter. That was another good lesson learned. And I think you only kind of realize that after you're probably in midway in your career uh, because, you know, Initially, you start, okay, I'm doing my job, I'm doing my job well, I feel comfortable in my job, you know, I'm excelling in my job, but that's not always enough. Okay. Last yeah. question uh, of this interview, uh, Natasha, is, is, is always, what is the advice that you would give maybe to your younger self or to future digital leaders that want to uh, follow in your footsteps? and also want to, be, uh, to make a big IT career in a large corporate. What is, what's the advice to, uh, to these people? Uh, I would say uh, get out of your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to speak to your clients. Don't be isolated because sometimes we are afraid to bring bad news to the clients. But actually the clients, when their expectations are managed and when they feel informed, they actually provide much better uh, input to you and they are much friendlier as well. So don't be afraid mm -hmm. to speak directly with the clients and really customer focus is essential because technical excellence without customer focus, it's, you know, it's, it's just a dream, right? Because you need to be relevant, you need to be pragmatic, you need to be honest and you need to maintain customer focus and customer excellence at all times, even if you feel uncomfortable about it. So embrace it, and once you commit it, do it. Okay, and on that note, Natasha, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing all your insights, and I look forward to meeting you again very soon in London. Thank you so much. Thank you, it was a pleasure, Hendrik.